We move on now to our second speaker, Professor Yair Zakovich, who really needs no introduction. Professor Emeritus of Bible at the Hebrew University and Professor of Jewish Peoplehood, is that? Maybe. Jewishness. You know, the Chinese came up with something called Chineseness based on Jewishness because all their young people want to study high tech and they want them to study Chinese heritage. Anyway, uh, and uh, so Yair is professor of uh, Jewish peoplehoodness at the, Bain, at the Center for Interdisciplinary Studies in Herzliya. And of course, he writes about the biblical story, uh, biblical thought, early commentary on the Bible, and I have to tell you one more thing. Some years ago, there was a celebration at the President's house in Jerusalem to celebrate the completion of a series of biblical commentaries that many of you worked on called Encyclopedia Olam HaTanach. And we had many of you faculty members there, and Professor Moshe Weinfeld of Blessed Memory was there. And you would have thought she wanted would want to hear the president's wife, the first lady, Rauma Weizmann, would want to hear from these learned uh, people about biblical studies. Instead, she gave a lecture about how much she enjoyed Yair Zakovich's lectures at Van Leer. Yair Zakovich. Chairman Gruber, thank you very much for your introduction, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my topic is uh, what to tell, to tell or not to tell the case of Jacob in Shem. Um, you know that uh, historians always face the challenge, what traditions should be included, what traditions should be kept out, what traditions should be given large space, what traditions should be mentioned only briefly. Um, I have um, Yetzer Hara to try and to uh, reconstruct traditions that have not been mentioned, that have been ignored by biblical writers. Sometimes these traditions make it to some later stages of our literature and we can find them there. Anyway, let's look at Jacob et Shechem. What, what is our inventory? Uh, and towards the end of my talk, I may actually look into three traditions that might have been known to biblical writers and ignored by them. Uh, ignored by them because they didn't want to make Shechem too positive. They didn't want to make Shechem into a tourist attraction because Shechem is a bad, bad place. Uh, of course, uh, Second Temple Judaism had almost nothing good to say about Shechem. Uh, the conflict between Jews and Samaritans played a major role in creating this attitude. Uh, towards the end of Ben Sira, and all of you are kindly requested to look at my um, handout. Uh, towards the end of Ben Sira, we read, My whole being loathed to two nations, the third is not a people, those who live in Seir and Philistia, and the brutish folk that dwell in Shechem, Goy Naval Hadar Bishchem, and of course that brings us back to Shirat Ha'azinu, to Deuteronomy uh, 32-21. They incest me with no gods, vexed me with their uh, fertilities, I, I'll incest them with no folk, vex them with a nation of fools, Goy Naval. How come a creation was a, a combination a, a connection was made between uh, uh, Goy Naval in Deuteronomy 32 and Shechem. That's because of the Nevala, the Nevala that has been committed, uh, the outrage that has been committed in Shechem in Genesis 34 verse 7. He had committed an outrage Nevala in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter. 
Um, and of course, when we get in, uh, getting back into this story in the book of Genesis, Genesis 34, and I'm not going to say anything about this story because Mayor Sternberg is here and the Ira Amit is here, and they have said already enough about this, everything that has to be said, had to be said about this story, but it's clear to me that at least the final version of this story agrees with the massacre that has been taken there in Shechem, uh, because when the, Jacob brings up his fear of the Canaanites, his sons, Shimon and Levi, answer him with this rhetorical question, should our sister be treated like a whore? And that puts an end to the story. And later on in verse 5 of chapter 35, even God agrees somehow with the massacre because we read that as they set out a terror from God fell on the cities round about so they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. So this is a negative tradition about Shem and that's fine. Uh, the, the one and only perhaps a positive tradition about Shem in the book of Genesis is of course the story, the, the short tradition in the end of chapter 33 about the purchase of Shem by Jacob. Uh, and it's there because we need it. We need, we need it as part of this pattern, the four cities in the land of Israel that have been purchased by us. Uh, uh, and the cities are, of course, Hebron, uh, the cave of Machpelah in Genesis 23, the story uh, David in 2 Samuel chapter 24, Jerusalem. Uh, one verse only in 1, uh, in 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 24, the purchase of Samaria by Omri, and this little story here. And, uh, but uh, it's necessary, it's necessary as polemics about, you know, the, the claim that some enemies may say that we have conquered this country, so no, we have the right to it. And it's clear, it's so cl very clear that we have a pattern, because two cities are in Judah, two cities are in Israel. Two cities are in the patriarchal area, two cities are the, uh, in the time of the monarchy. Um, and all four cities at some point have been capital cities of their countries. Um, and uh, the rabbis have understood very well why we have these stories, as we read in Genesis Rabba, Rabbi Yudan Bar Simon said, this is one, referring to Genesis thirty three eighteen. this is one of the three places that the nations of the world cannot they, they forgot about the fourth one, about Samaria. Okay, so they knew only about three ones, but that's why I'm here. So uh, that's one of the three places that the nations of the world cannot cheat Israel and say they were seized by you through fraud, etc. Anyway, so... Um, uh, and this, ver and this is, but you have, we have to pay attention to the fact that this is a very short tradition in Genesis 33. If you compare it with the long stories of 2 Samuel 24 or of Genesis 23, you see that the writer did the minimum. He didn't want to expand too much to talk about it for too long because it's Shem. And of course, this verse plays. Uh, an important, uh, this verse plays an important role much later uh, when we reach the book of Joshua, the end of the book of Joshua, when we hear that Joseph is actually being buried in this very place, Joshua 24, 32, but that's not in the book of Genesis. Um, if we um, look at the book, continue looking at the book of Genesis, we, we read chapter 35, verses 1 to 4. When God, uh, when, uh, verses 1 to 4 in chapter 25, between the end of the story of Dina and, the, and verse 5, which I have already read to you, about God uh, protecting the people of Israel, uh, uh, Jacob's family when they were leaving Shechem. So in chapter 25, uh, 35, verses 1 to 4, God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel and remain there, and build an altar there to the God who appeared to you when you were fleeing from your brother Esau. So Jacob said to his household and all uh, who were with him, 
purify yourselves and change your clothes. Oh, well, of course, those of you who follow the handouts see that I've missed, uh, I have uh, missed some words here, I, deliberately, of course, because I think that, first of all, I wanted to see if you are alert, and, uh, <laughs> um, and you are not, <laughs> and B, and no, no, you were, I saw it, uh, and B, I uh, just believe that these, uh, the words that I have uh, deleted uh, are a secondary element there. Because yes, Jacob is asked to, uh, uh, asking his people to purify themselves the way uh, we were asked to purify ourselves at the bottom of Mount Sinai in Exodus chapter 19, let them wash their clothes, etc., to prepare for the great event, and this way, they, in Genesis 35, they had to purify themselves because before they were going to build an altar. But for somebody, it was very important to add here, read yourselves of the alien gods in your midst, and, the, and more words that er, were added to this scene, uh, the end of this scene, verse 4, they gave to Jacob all the alien gods that they had and the rings that were in their ears and Jacob buried them under the terebinth that was in Shechem. That's very, very important. If we want to make Shechem into a really bad place, that's the best way to do it, to bury some alien gods there because this place will be defiled forever and ever. If you want to get rid of alien gods, we have our ways to do it. We can burn it, we can do, uh, we, we know what we have done with the golden uh, calf, for instance, but by burying it there, we make sure that it, it's, it's worse than having some radioactive material. It will be there forever and ever. And indeed, the Septuagint even adds at the end of verse 4, and they, meaning these alien gods, and they are there until this very day. Ad etzim hayom hazeh. And um, these verses, or these elements, were added to the story uh, as a polemics against the tradition we have in Joshua chapter 24. In Joshua chapter 24, which is a very unique chapter, has very good, um, uh, presents, uh, Shechem is a very good place, actually the best place in the country, the place where the Torah was given to Israel by Joshua. This, yeah, this, uh, actually the story of Joshua 24, to, according to Joshua 24, the Torah was not given in the wilderness, in the wilderness, we just heard here there, and you lived a long time in the wilderness in verse 7. And, and it's not that it was neglected or forgotten some, somehow, but deliberately the giving of the law is not mentioned there because it was not possible, according to Joshua 24, to give the Torah in the wilderness because the Israelites were still worshipping idols. Joshua is speaking about it, how the Israelites, wherever they were, they worshipped idols. Beyond the Euphrates, in Egypt, they were always worshipping idols. And here and now, when I speak to you at Shechem before I die, not me, he, before he dies, he says to them, well, now it's time for you to decide whether you are going to worship the God of Israel or you are going to continue to worship some alien gods. And they, for some reason, decided to worship the God of Israel. And when they decide to do it, they say to him, we will serve none but the Lord our God. Uh, we will obey none but him. It's an seven Ishma, you see, you hear here the seven Ishma words of, or, and then Joshua, of course, gave them, made them a fixed rule for them. Chok uh, umishpat, he, he's putting them chok umishpat, and here you have a clear echo of uh, Exodus 15:25 when we hear about Moses, sham sam lochok umishpat v'sham nisahu, there he made them a fixed rule. And after Joshua is giving them Torah at Shechem, he, what he does, he actually writes a book of divine instruction. He took a great stone and set it up at the foot of the turbine in the sacred, in the sacred person of the Lord. So you see that we have here the Eilah, or uh, the uh, 
um, vocalization is Allah in, uh, to, uh, in Joshua 24, and it's a sacred place, and you know what's there under the tree. It's uh, the stone that uh, Joshua put there to commemorate the great event. But Genesis 20 and Genesis 35 is telling you, forget about it. That's the most defiled place in the world. And this, under this very tree, what's there are actually the, the, the alien gods. So you see that you see that Shem really has bad reputation in the book of Genesis. Uh, another event that is mentioned, and you see it's mentioned just in one single verse, it's uh, Genesis 48, verse 22. Um, and now I assign to you, Natadi lechashchem echad alachecha asher lakachti miyad ha'emori becharbi uvekashti. And now I send you, I assign you one portion, and it's translated as if it's not related to Shem, to the, to the place name, as if Shem is just a, a, a noun, a, a chelek, a portion, which is a very rare use of this word. I can find perhaps oh, one more place in the Bible where Shem is understood as chelek, as a portion, and there is, it's actually a word play on the name Shem, and that's in the book of Psalms, Psalm 60, verse 8, achalka Shem. So it's playing with the name Shem using its synonym, the verb tchet lamet kuf. But uh, here we have a tradition, very strange tradition about J Jacob being a great warrior, about Jacob uh, conquering Shechem. And, and again, you see that only one verse is dedicated to this tradition. And uh, actually, it's quite interesting that when Joshua is giving his overview of our history in the chapter I have already mentioned, in Joshua chapter 24, he said, I sent a, a plague ahead of you, and it drove them out before you, not by your sword or by your bow. Meaning as if, uh, as if he's not interested, uh, or, is, or is if he wants us to forget the tradition that we took part of this country, including Shechem, by sword, and not by miraculous acts by, of God. So far, that's, these are the traditions that we have in Genesis about Shechem. Again, not a nice place that you would like to go to today, since you know it's a very defiled place. But three more traditions that are not mentioned in the Hebrew Bible, and we have to consider the fact that these are very like pre-biblical traditions that for some reason the biblical writers did not want to include. The first one is the one we read in the Gospel of John. Well, written much later than the Hebrew, the, the Hebrew text of the book of Genesis, written towards the end of the first century CE. And here we have this beautiful story about Jacob's well. Jacob's well in Shechem. He, 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 Jesus, had to pass through Samaria, so he came to a city of Samaria called Sichar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And that's, of course, a reference to Josh, uh, Genesis 48-22. Um, uh, Jacob's well was there. It's taken for granted, as if it's well known. This is Jacob's well. And so Jesus, wearied as he was with his journey, sat down beside the well. It was about the sixth hour, and there came a woman of Samaria. So you see, we have the famous uh, synth, uh, type scene again of a, an encounter between a man and a woman at the well. Not all encounters are romantic ones as you very well know. And uh, there came a woman of Samaria to draw water, and Jesus said to her, give me to drink. So uh, for his disciple had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And uh, I don't want to get into this whole story. You can read it later on, tonight, before you go to sleep. But... Uh, What's, what's important for me is just what we can read at verse 11. 
The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where do you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself and his sons and his cattle? Well, there is a famous place in Shechem, which is known as Jacob's well, and of course, uh, many readers of the Gospel of John later on know exactly to show you where this uh, well is. And uh, many travelers mention the well later on, or including the first traveler, the one from Bordeaux, who, uh, who was the first tourist of Israel who left behind him a diary. And he tells us about this well, or also Jerome in his uh, report about the journey of Paula in the year 404 also mentions the well. And uh, uh, it's very interesting to see uh, how um, later on, <laughs> much, much later, uh, we too, we meaning Jews, also mention uh, a well of Jacob, but not in Shechem. A well of Jacob, where in Hebron? Look at uh, number three, the travels of Moshe ben Eliyahu the Karite from Crimea. Now Crimea is in the news. There is a well there in Hebron named Abraham's well, and another one named Isaac's well, and another named Jacob's well. And Arabs or Greeks still use those names referring to the wells. That's very interesting. The way we have buried all our patriarchs at Hebron, all patriarchs at the end found themselves in the cave of Machpelah, as we know. And here we see that all wells dug by the patriarchs also find their way to Hebron at the end. Meaning, for us, the people of Judah, it's very important to say that everything has taken place in our part of the country. So everybody is buried there and everybody's uh, wells are there. So Jacob is presented to us here too as one, as one that like his fathers, like fathers like son, he also dug a well in the country. And his, But where is the well? That's the question. According to one tradition, the one uh, we read in the New Testament, it's in Shechem, according to much later tradition, Jewish tradition, Karai tradition, this well is actually in Hebron. Uh, by the way, it's uh, talking about everybody being buried in Hebron. Uh, we know we know very well where Joseph is buried. He's buried in Shechem, as we said. But if you look at the testaments, testaments of the twelve sons of Jacob, all sons of Jacob are buried in Hebron, including Joseph. Meaning at the end of every testament, we are being told that this, uh, after the, uh, the, the patriarch or the head of the tribe is uh, giving his directions to the children, he dies and he's buried in Hebron. So even, even Joseph, Joseph's bones were removed by this writer from Shechem to Hebron. So I, I, look, I cannot be certain that this is a pre-biblical tradition. Perhaps one day we'll find more evidence to it, but we have to take it into consideration. Another one that um, I believe that here in the Bible we do find something that may, uh, may give us an idea that this is a pre-biblical tradition. It's, it's the tradition about the pit into which Joseph was thrown. And we know it was in Dotan, and we can read it in this uh, chapter, chapter 37 of Genesis. Uh, uh, one time when his brothers had gone to pasture their father's flock at Shechem, and again, the name Shechem is mentioned again and again and again in this little uh, story. Israel said to Joseph, your brothers are pasturing in at Shechem, come, I'll send you to them. He answered, I'm ready. And he said to him, go and see how your brothers are, are and how the flocks are faring and bring me back word. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron when he reached Shechem. And it's not going now, it's not going to happen in Shechem. It's going, it's going to happen in Dotan. This man, being it a human man or an angelic man, 
but this man is telling him that his brothers are in Dotan and it's very nice that actually the pit is in Dotan as Yoel Elitsu has actually shown us that um, uh, there is a nice word play because Dut is a bow, Dut is a pit and uh, a bow is a pit and the story tells us about a bow but uh, we, we are familiar with this kind of name derivations that uh, we have a name but uh, we know what it's the synonym of the name is and the word play plays with a synonym. I'll give you just one example. Moshe Garciel knows like 110 of them but uh, uh, for instance in the story of Gideon uh, when he cuts down the Asherah uh, the name, the name is Gideon from the Shorosh Gadoa, but in the story itself you'll find again and again the root Karot, 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 which is the synonym of Gadoa, and you won't find the, name, the root Gadoa there. So, uh, so I think that Elitzur is quite right about Dotan, but why was it important all of a sudden uh, to, to switch from Shem and to go somewhere else? Why? He doesn't, when you read the story, you don't expect it to happen. It would have been quite natural. He gets to Shechem and, and his brothers were there and they, find, and they put him into the pit and that's the end of the story. And um, I believe that, again, the, for somebody it was important to take it out of Shechem, to take the pit out of Shechem because they didn't want to tell any stories uh, about this location. They didn't want people to get too attracted to Shechem, to come to Shechem, to look into these places. And, the fa and here we have in the Babylonian, in the Babylonian Talmud, in Baba, uh, no, no, I'm sorry. Uh, here we have in Genesis Rabbah, um, uh, 85.3, uh, a, a, a piece of evidence that uh, rabbis have still believed that the pit was in Shechem. Another matter, Joseph said to them, to his brothers, I impose on you an oath that uh, to the place from which you stole me, you will restore my bones, which is Shechem, of course. And so did the children of Israel do. And the bones of Joseph, which the children of Israel brought up from Egypt, they buried in Shechem. So for this tradition, it's very clear the place was Shechem. By the way, again, later travelers to the land of Israel mentioned the very pit of, have found, have located the very pit in Shechem, including like a Russian bishop in the 12th century, Bishop Daniel mentions the pit in Shechem and some other travelers too. Uh, the third, um, the third uh, tradition is it's already well known and Levenstam has written about it. Um, and that's about the burial of Jacob. Again, we all know that Jacob is buried in Hebron with his, with his father and grandfather. They're all together there, but when we read Genesis chapter 50, verse 5, my, uh, when Joseph says, My father made me swear, saying, I'm about to die. Be sure to bury me in the grave which I made ready, ready kariti for myself in the land of Canaan. Now, therefore, let me go up and bury my father, etc. Uh, kariti. The verb kariti can be understood in two different ways. Either kariti is to dig, lachfor, like in Numbers 21:18, uh, sarim am, which the nobles of Israel dug, or either or, or if karo means to buy, kano to purchase, maim tichru meitam bakesef, Deuteronomy chapter two verse six, water you drink you shall purchase from them for money. Either or, anyway, it, it can't relate to the story of the cave of Machpelah. Jacob neither have dug himself a, a grave in Machpelah, nor has he purchased himself a piece of land in the cave of Machpelah. But Jacob did purchase himself a piece of land in Shechem. So, and indeed, in Acts, uh, again, in the New Testament, in Acts chapter 7, verses 6, uh, 15 and 16, uh, 
uh, when Stephanos, before dying, uh, the first Mahdi before he dies, he gives this historical survey, survey and uh, he says, and Jacob went down into Egypt, and he died, himself and our fathers, and they were carried back to Shechem, and laid in the tomb, and here some confusion, and they were laid in the tomb that Abraham had bought for a sum of silver from the son of Hamor in Shechem. So you see the confusion between the cave of Machpelah and Shechem with Ab Abraham being involved here, but it's clearly a tradition about Jacob being buried in Shechem, and it makes sense that Joseph is actually buried uh, in Shechem in the same place that his father Jacob was buried. That, that's the tradition that Shechemites or the people of Ephraim would love us to believe. Uh, as you very well know, graves are, gives you a great political power. Graves are very important until this very day. To sum up, well, we saw that J Jacob did have some clear presence in Shechem. He left his footprints in this place. But um, uh, writers of Genesis they were not that fond of the place, and that's why the tradition about the purchase of Shechem was actually um, abridged, and that's why the story, on the other hand, about the purification by, while leaving Shechem was actually expanded and included, and the element of burying the alien gods were included there. And who knows, perhaps other traditions about Shechem were omitted by the writers of Genesis, the one about Jacob's well, about, uh, the one about Jacob's pit, and about the one about Jacob's being buried in Shechem. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. And we have time for one question. One question. Please. Uh, in the Rashid uh, chapter If you can stand up so I can hear you. <laughs> uh, because I have to see in order to hear. <laughs> uh, in Genesis chapter 12, Abraham... Yes. Abraham uh, Yes. Positive, very positive. Yes, uh, yes, indeed. Uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, you can, you could not enter the land of Israel with, without going through Shechem uh, at some point. Um, uh, Shechem was like the like the Tel Aviv airport nowadays. Shechem was in the biblical times. You had to get to Shechem to build the, to build an altar, and that's what the way to get into the country. So the first place that Abraham gets to when he gets to the country in Genesis chapter 12 is Shechem, the first place when Jacob comes back to, she to Israel after 20 years in Haran, he builds an altar in Shechem, indeed, and also in Deuteronomy chapter 27, Moses is telling us that when we enter the country, we will have to build an altar in Shechem. So, of course, you have this trend too, and I think that that's why you have uh, and uh, you are quite right in mentioning this tradition about Abraham in Shechem. I see some conflict going on here. Uh, look, between Judahites and Ephraimites. Um, um, if, you, if, you uh, um, if you put a chip into Abraham's ear and follow all the places he was going through, you'll see that Abraham is the person of the south, southern Israel. He's the man of Beersheba. He's the man of Hebron, etc., etc. While Jacob uh, is the man of northern Israel, of the uh, kingdom of Ephraim. He is Bethel, he is Shechem, etc., etc. But here and there you see that biblical writers are trying to, uh, to uh, I don't know if it's a Judahite, uh, I, I would have, I actually would believe that perhaps a, an Israelite writer would put also Abraham in Shechem to, to, to try and to tell the Judahites, look, Shechem is, uh, Shechem is important for all of us, not just for you, for us Ephraimites, but also for you Judahites. So it was important to, uh, to put Abraham in Shechem too. Uh, uh, more than that, I cannot say, but thank you for bringing it up. <laughs>